This morning we are going to look at the crucifixion. And of course this is uh, probably the most important aspect of the gospel, but it's also the saddest aspect of the gospel. Because you have Jesus living and teaching and moving and touching and healing lives and then being betrayed by his own people, being served up, as you would say, uh, as a criminal, a common criminal. And so even though it's the greatest aspect of our relationship because we couldn't have anything without the cross it's also a very sad time uh, in history for what actually took place and for the way they treated Jesus uh, last week I gave you a memory verse Colossians chapter three seventeen. Uh, it's a great verse and hopefully you enjoyed it during your Thanksgiving time uh, Colossians three seventeen says and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him and that's our hope that as in everything we accept the good the bad the ugly and we give him thanks whatever circumstance whatever event whatever we face we trust him because he alone is sovereign and that's where God wants us to live from that position of humility where we know it's not about us we know the world doesn't revolve around our wishes and our wants and our dreams and our hopes that the world revolves around Jesus and Jesus alone that everything is for him and through him and to him and so our lives are pointing or should be pointing to Jesus so we're gonna start here in Luke chapter 23 and pick up at verse 26 and we're gonna see Jesus and Simon you know first it starts with them sending Jesus away and we see a picture of Jesus and Simon Luke 23 26 says and they led him away now when they say they led him away they're talking about out of Pilate's presence right he was in the hall where he was being judged as people were shouting crucify crucify you know and Pilate was doing his best to try to have him released but the people prevailed and so he released Barabbas and he sent Jesus to be crucified so as they led him away they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Now it was custom and it was part of the, the prisoner's humiliation to carry his own cross to the execution. It was a way of humiliating the prisoner. But in all that Jesus had been through, the beatings, the lashings, the severity of what he had experienced, apparently he was unable at this point to carry his own cross. So they seized and ordered Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross, which was a legal Roman procedure. They could put somebody else in that person's place to carry the cross. So Simon would have walked behind Jesus bearing the cross. Now, I want to just talk for a minute about what I would call divine interruptions. <laughs> Nobody likes to be interrupted. When you're at home doing work and your kids come in like, Dad, Dad, Dad. You know, I remember when my kids were little, you know, I had four, so they were constantly coming to the door. Hey, Dad, can you go play catch with me? Hey, Dad, can you do this? I'm like, I'm trying to study. I'm trying to study. You know, I'm working on my message for Sunday. I'm trying to study. So that's why I moved to the office where nobody could interrupt me, right? Lock myself in a room all alone. But you have to realize that if God is sovereign, do you believe that God is sovereign? If you believe that God is sovereign and that all things providentially work together for our good then even our interruptions are divine that even the interruptions throughout your day through, think about simon now simon's on the way to jerusalem for what the passover and out of all the people there simon gets chose simon gets ordered simon gets drug away to bear the cross of jesus historians tell us that he became a believer a Christ follower you know that he walked behind Jesus in his footsteps but I'm sure Simon had plans man he's showing up for the Passover he's got to get a place to eat he's got to get his meal he's got to maybe purchase his lamb he's got all these things to do and it's just like us we're going through our day and we have all these things to do you know we got our checklist we got to get this done and we got to get that done and we got to be here and we got to be there and sometimes these interruptions, which are meant to gain our focus, they're meant to turn our attention to something greater, to something bigger. But because we're often so busy, we miss the interruptions. 
they're right there before us. And, and they come for a reason. God works all things together. All things have purpose. So when you are interrupted in life, your car breaks down, you have a flat tire, your friend is sick, you have plans, and something interrupts them, you have to realize that there's a purpose behind it all. You might not always understand the purpose. You might not always see the purpose. But you've got to turn to God and say, God, what are you trying to show me? God, what do you want to teach me? What do I need to learn as I take up the cross? See, that's the goal. Simon took up the cross. He carried the cross. So when God brings interruptions into our lives, a lot of times he's trying to say, take up the cross. You've got to look at your life. It's not about you because most interruptions, they bother us. Why? Because we're selfish, and we're not getting what we wanted to get done. I mean, we have a whole list of things we want to do. We have places we want to be, and when somebody interrupts us, we don't like it. And so the next time you are interrupted, I want you to step back and say, this is divine. I need to remember the cross. I need to remember the cross. I need to remember that Simon had to carry the cross. And that there's a purpose in this for my life. Simon was pulled out of the crowd. Think about it. There are thousands upon thousand people who had traveled to Jerusalem for Passover. Do you think it was a coincidence that Simon was chosen? Do you think it was by chance that Simon was chosen? No. It was with purpose. And when God is at work in your life, it's always with purpose. Simon bore the cross for Jesus. Simon carried his cross. I know that Jesus wants you to carry your cross. He wants me to carry my cross. He wants us to keep our eyes on him. So you see Jesus and Simon, but then you see Jesus and what we would call the Jerusalem women. Man, the Bible says, and there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Now, remember, historically, public executions drew great crowds. Whether it was a lynching or whether it was a cross, public executions always brought people together. This one especially, because it was Jesus. Jesus. People had heard rumors about Jesus. People had heard stories about Jesus. So all the people being in Jerusalem for the Passover, the crowds, the multitudes were beyond what we can comprehend. The streets were packed with people, people probably from the balconies, people watching what's going on. And add to the fact that, you know, everybody wanted to see who this Jesus was. People that had never seen him, probably trying to get close to him, trying to get up in the crowd. But in the middle of the crowd, there's women following Jesus that are mourning. They're weeping. They're lamenting because of the spiritual condition of Israel. And so Jesus turns and he looks to them and he says, don't weep for me. Now you have to understand, as far as the gospel records, Jesus never had, or we never see, not one time where he had animosity or enmity with a woman. The women loved Jesus. And Jesus did more for women than anyone has ever done in history. Ever. Because at this point in time, women were considered like cattle. They were something to be traded or done away with. A woman couldn't divorce a man, but a man could divorce a woman. A woman had no legal rights. Jesus changed all that. His example, his teaching, and most of all, his redemptive work did more for women than we can even imagine. He showed the world that they were equal. And, you know, when a message was brought about his new birth, who was it brought to? It was brought to a Jewish maiden. When he died, he was witnessed by a grieving woman. And the gospel, the good news, was first shared at the resurrection by an angel to a, a woman. A lot of women feel like Christianity is oppressive. They're like, oh man, you know, I don't want to be a Christian because you got to submit to your husband and it's oppressive to women. Listen to me. Christianity has done more for women than we can even imagine. It has made us equals. 
They're neither male nor female, nor Jew or Greek, right? We're all the same in Christ. God gives men and women both spiritual gifts. He gives us both opportunities. You have to know that these women were weeping because of what was happening to Israel and also what was happening to Jesus because they loved Jesus. But at the same time, Jesus turns to them and says, you shouldn't weep for me because I'm looking into the future. I know what's going to happen. You should be weeping for yourselves and for your children. He says, for behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say, in the mountains or to the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us for if they do these things when the wood is green what will happen when it is dry what jesus is talking about is the destruction of jerusalem what will take place he knew in 70 a.d the romans would surround jerusalem and what they would do is they would set up a camp and starve its people so the men who were trying to fight for the city you know what? When they got hungry, they took food from their women and their children. And it was even reported that some men ate the children. Historically, the nation of Israel was in a great place. It was green like a tree during the ministries of Jesus while he was there. There was opportunity. There was peace. I mean, as far as they had it. And they had an opportunity to see the Messiah, to accept the Messiah. So Jesus says, if it's green while it's fresh, if they'll do these things now to me, if they're going to crucify me, if they're going to betray me, if they're going to reject me now, what's going to happen when it's dry? It'll be ready for the fire. It'll be burned up. And that's exactly what happened to Israel. And that's why Jesus is... Saying, look, don't weep for me. You need to weep for yourselves. You need to weep for the nation. You need to weep for your children. I mean, for a woman, having a child was everything in Israel. If a woman was barren, if a woman was barren, it was like a curse. But Jesus, I mean, look what he says. He says, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren. Completely opposite of what they believed and belonged to or longed for. Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore because of what their children and these women would experience. So Jesus now is moving forward to the cross, and we see Jesus and the criminals. And in my opinion, in this story, the criminals represent us as people. You know, prophecy, it's also God teaching us. It's pretty incredible the way this all works together. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and one on his left. Now, it was prophesied that the suffering servant would be numbered with the transgressors, right? Isaiah 53, verse 12. Two criminals, one on each side, are being crucified with Jesus. They were known as criminals. Some translations say robbers. Uh, Matthew uses the phrase robbers, but the Greek word literally means one who uses violence to rob. There's a difference in a thief who just breaks in secretly and steals your stuff. And there's a difference between a robber who does armed robbery who like uses violence. Some believe that these guys were not only guilty of robbery, but also of murder. I'm not sure, but I know that they were thieves and they were being crucified. So I don't know that they would have crucified them for just stealing, but they definitely would have crucified them for murder. So these two guys, one on each side, are on the way to Calvary. Now the name Calvary, you know, comes from a Latin word, Calvary. That's where we get the Latin word for Calvary, Calvera, and it means a skull. That's what it means, a skull. The Greek is cranium, 
It's where we get the word cranium from. It's where we get the word cranium. That's the Greek word for what we call the skull. In Aramaic, it was called Galgatha. So you hear people talking about Galgatha, you hear talking about the skull, you talk about Calvary, but it's really all the same place. Some people believe that they call it Galgatha or the skull is because the site looked like a skull. You know, there's a place if you were to go visit Israel right now called Gordon's Calvary. It's the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem, and it's shaped kind of like a skull. I don't know. I've never been there, but that's what I've been told. But some believe it was called the skull just because of the carcasses and bodies and all the death and experience that took place there. But we know that they were headed there. Jesus, along with common criminals, because it was prophesied that he would die with the sinful, even though he had committed no sin. So you have to understand that when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't go because he was guilty. He went because we are guilty. Listen to me. I am guilty. I am sinful. I need a Savior. And every man, woman, boy or girl that has ever lived is guilty. And we all need a substitutionary atonement. We need a substitute. We need a sacrifice. We need a Savior. We need somebody to take our place. And that's what God did by sending his son in likeness of sinful man. That's why Philippians 2 says that he laid aside his deity. The use of it. He didn't stop being God. He just didn't act like God. He acted like us, even though he was 100% God. But he was still 100% man. So he gave us a perfect example of how to live. How to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How to trust in the Father. How to walk through this life. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Father, forgive them. Think about this. They're nailing him to a cross. And he cries out, Father, forgive them. His first statement of seven. Jesus made seven statements while hanging on the cross. It's believed that he was crucified around 9 a.m., that it lasted for at least six hours to around 3 p.m., During the first three hours, he makes statements, and then there's this period of darkness, this period of nothing, and then a final cry. His first statement was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His second statement was, today you will be with me in paradise, when he's talking to the thief, and we'll see that in verse 43. And then it says, woman, behold your son, comforting his mother while he's dying. While he's dying, he's thinking about others. John chapter 1, verse 28. And then you see him say, why has thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 46. Why? You know, because in his humanity, he felt the separation. He felt the pain. And then I thirst. John chapter 19, verse 28. And then my favorite is the statement when he cries out, it is finished. John chapter 19, verse 30. It is finished to Telestai. And then the last, which we'll see here in verse 46. Father, into thy hands I commit myself. Jesus made seven statements. Luke only records three. Luke records the first statement, the second statement, and the last statement. And I believe he did that with a purpose. Because... His purpose in writing was that people would see the suffering Savior, see the sympathy that he had for people, and that he cared for the needy. And so he starts off with practicing what he preached. You remember back in Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. What is he doing? He's praying for those who persecute him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Listen to me. You are never more like Christ than when you walk in forgiveness. Never. 
And as believers, a defining mark that should set us apart from the world is our ability to forgive others when they offend us or hurt us. I think unforgiveness is a critical sin in the church today because we hold on to stuff. We run it through our minds. I can't believe they said this to me. I can't believe they did this. Instead of laying it down and bringing it to the cross, you run it through your mind over and over. You replay it and you rehearse it instead of taking your thoughts captive and giving it to Christ. Forgiveness is the defining mark that we are truly his. The Bible tells us to forgive one another just as God in Christ Jesus forgave us. Right? Ephesians 4.32 we're supposed to walk in forgiveness. How many times do we hold things that people say or people do? You say, well, how do I know if I held it? Well, because if you're thinking about it, you're holding on to it. If you're thinking about it, it's bothering you. If you're running it through your mind, if you're rehearsing it in your thoughts, it's still there. You haven't let it go. You haven't laid it down. Forgiveness is a process too. It doesn't happen all at once. Somebody hurts you. Somebody does something to you. In that moment, you bring it to God. And then you keep bringing it to God. Every time the thought comes up, you take the thought captive. And you say, Lord, help me to forgive right now, to walk in forgiveness, to lay this at your feet, to cast all my cares upon you because you care for me. And then you lay it down. And then that thought comes back up, you bring it back to the cross. And you lay it down. And that thought comes until, guess what? One day you're going to wake up, and that thought won't be in your mind anymore. You won't think about what somebody said or what somebody did or how somebody hurt you. The thought will be gone. It will be behind you, and it will have no power over you. But as long as you think about it, as long as you run it through your mind, you're going to get bitter. You're going to be angry. And then this root of bitterness is going to grow up and wrap itself around your heart till it squeezes the life out of you. We all grow old, but we all don't grow up. And sometimes I see people that are very old, but not very grown up because the bitterness has choked the life out of them. And they're grouchy and they're irritable and they're cranky. Why? Because they have no peace and they have no joy. You see, the devil wants to rob your peace and he wants to steal your joy. And he does it through unforgiveness. You have to take offenses and you have to take your pain and your trials and you have to bring it to the cross. It's not about us. It's not about our struggles or our issues or our problems. It's about bringing it to the cross, and it's about living from the cross, walking in his likeness. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They're pounding the nails into his hands. They're pounding the nails into his feet. They have whipped him. They have beat him. They have spit on him. They have mocked him. They've ridiculed him. He's never harmed anyone. He is completely innocent, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Most likely his intestines were hanging out because the cat of nine tails, it had nine balls that were made with stone and glass and bone and stuff brought together. So when they whipped you with this thing, man, they would whip it and yank it and it would just grab onto your meat and it would just rip right into your body. Apparently why he couldn't carry the cross. The Romans would beat you with rods, break your legs, bruise you up. They ripped his beard from his face. Read Isaiah. And your beard hair isn't like your hair from up here that has little roots. Your beard hair has long roots. It would have ripped chunks of meat out of his face. And that crown of thorns, it wasn't little tiny thorns. There were thorns, three, four inches that were shoved down in his brow so that blood was in the pain and the nerve endings in your body being pressed against the cross in more agony and more pain than we can even imagine. And he cries out, get him, Father. No. <laughs> Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Listen to me. You want to be like Jesus? Start walking in forgiveness. I want you to make a mental checklist sitting down and write a paper. Start thinking about things you've held against people. You say, well, how do I know? Because you're thinking about it still. If you've got something you're still thinking about, you're holding on to it, and you haven't let it go. 
and you take the words or the hurts or the betrayals or the rejection and you write them out and you say, God, I want to surrender this to you. I want to lay this at the cross. And you see yourself bringing it to the cross and you go through that list every day until you don't think about them anymore so that you are free. Look, Jesus came to set us free. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. But the devil, man, he wants you to think about somebody being a jerk or somebody being no good or somebody being this or somebody being that because he wants to get under your skin. He wants you to live in your past. Don't do it. Don't do it. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. It should be noted that all this stuff that was happening didn't catch God off guard. God was like, oh man, I can't believe they're doing that to my son. Because all these things, every act was prophesied. I mean, all the way to the sour wine, to the beatings, it was all prophesied, every bit of it. It was just being fulfilled. I mean, the gambling over his clothes, Psalms twenty-two eighteen. They were casting lots for his clothes. The mocking him, Psalms 22, verses 6 through 8. The offering of the sour wine or the vinegar, Psalm 69, verse 21. Look, God was still on the throne while all this was happening. The pain was a part of the plan. Now, I know in our minds, we can't rationalize that. Why would a loving God allow this much pain in his own son's life? Because we're trying to see it from our perspective. But we have to learn to see it from his. And we have to trust him when we can't understand. You can't always understand the mind of God. You're not going to understand everything that God is doing or why. I mean, Romans eleven thirty three. who can know the mind of God? Who can understand his ways, right? You, you're not going to know them all. You just have to trust him. Your job is to walk with him by faith. Faith means that you place your allegiance in his hands and you trust him when you don't understand. You're not always going to know why everything is going on. And don't make assumptions. It drives me crazy. I can't imagine what it does to God. Well, he's more compassionate than I am. I know that because it drives me crazy when people say, you know what, I think God is doing this. Or I think maybe this is why this happened. God must be trying to do this. Or like, don't try to pretend you're God and that you know what God is doing. But we do it all the time. We see a circumstance and we say, you know what, I think God must be trying to do this. And we're like, when people tell me that, I just like, okay. I just smile and grin, right? I don't want to say you're an idiot, but I just smile and grin. Because the truth is, you don't know the mind of God. Yeah, God might be doing that, but he might not be doing that. You got a 50-50 chance, right? So why even try to assume that you know what God is doing? Just trust him. Your job isn't to figure out why these circumstances happen or why that's happening or why this is going to happen. Your job is just to walk with him. The righteous shall live by faith. Your job is to trust him in every circumstance and every event. The soldiers mocked him. They messed with him. They harassed him. The crowds were mocking him. People were shouting at him. Why? Because it was all a part of the plan. Listen to me. There will be pain in your life. And it's all a part of the plan. So when you're experiencing pain, know that God is in it. Because he's sovereign. See, we have to believe either God is sovereign, which means that he is completely and absolutely in control, or we believe that we're in control of our own destiny, and then we don't need God. See, you can't believe that God is in control and then not realize that everything he's doing is for your own good. If you believe the word of God, you have to see the sovereignty of God, because all these prophecies were in thousands of years before they were fulfilled, because God already saw it before it ever happened. He knew it was going to happen. He knows exactly what's going to happen to you tomorrow and next week. He knows if you'll wake up one day with cancer. He knows if you might get your leg chopped off. He knows. And if that happens to you, it's part of the plan. So you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for allowing me to serve you because I'm here for you. It's not about me. Verse 39 says, one of the criminals 
who were hanging railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. See, his motive was his selfishness. Yeah, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself oh, and us while you're at it, right? Get us too. Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, like we deserve this, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. What did this guy do to, to save himself? Nothing. Did saving himself get him off the cross? Nope. He still died. He was still paying for the consequences of his choices. But he was set free. See, often we think, well, if I become a believer, then all my bad things will go away. No, they won't. If you murder, you still go to prison, right? If you lie, you still pay the consequences. People see you as a liar. They can't be trusted. We still have to live with the consequences of our choices, but we can still be forgiven. You have to understand that this guy was set free. Why? Because he believed. He said, when you come into your kingdom, acknowledging that he was the king of the kingdom, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. He didn't say, please take me off the cross. He didn't say, please save us from this death. He said, just remember. He acted in faith, and because he acted in faith, Jesus saved him. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Listen to me. There's nothing you can do that can save yourself. It's not by reading your Bible. It's not by praying enough. It's not by doing this or doing that. You could never save yourself. You're only saved by the blood of Jesus. You're only saved because of what Jesus did for you. You can't be good enough or righteous enough or holy enough. You see, we're all in this sinking boat. And the only way we can get out is through Jesus. He's our redemption. He's our redeemer. He's our light. He's our hope. But what happens is we reach out to Jesus to save us, and then once we get saved, we start trying to work for him, trying to earn his love, trying to earn his approval. And you have to understand, the same Jesus that loved you when you were steeped in your sin loves you, and you don't have to earn anything. But your response should be, well, here's my life, right? Here am I. Take me, use me because of all that you've done. It's a response. We don't work for him so that we can get to heaven. We work for him because we're going to heaven. Do you understand the difference? We're saved because of what he did. Verse 44 says, it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun, sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now that's big. You got to understand that two massive things happened. First of all, when God delivered e Israel out of Egypt, how many days was there darkness? Three. All right. There were three days of darkness when God delivered Israel before the first Passover. And now, as God is making the ultimate Passover, there are three hours of darkness. It's awesome how they coincide, how they work together. Three days for the children of Israel, three hours for the redemption of man. This was a complete eclipse. Not like something covered uh, the sun. It wasn't because of the moon. It was because of God's grace. It would have been impossible for the moon to cover it because the moon was a full moon during Passover season in the east. It always is. During Passover season. So the, the moon didn't cover it. God covered it. God darkened the sky. It was almost like creation was crying out because of what was happening to the Son of Man. The second thing, there's an earthquake, but we don't see that here. But Matthew talks about the earthquake where people rose up out of the graves and were walking around. That had to be pretty awesome. I mean, talking about, an, you know, like that would have been freaky, right? Dead people walking around like, oh, man. 
I don't know if they walk like that or not. I don't know. They might have walked normal. I don't know. Hollywood puts my head up, you know. But we don't see that right here, but we do see the curtain torn. Now, the curtain, the veil, before the Holy of Holies was 10 inches thick. There is no way from top to bottom that it would just ripped in half. It was an act of God. Three acts of God. Bam, bam, bam. To show his divine judgment on Israel. And to create a new way to the Father. The only way Israel could get to the Father was through the curtain. That was their access point. The Holy of Holies, right? The high priest had to go before the Ark of the Covenant. Had to go before God and meet with God one-on-one -on -one for the people of Israel. Well, there was no more need because Jesus had made open access. And so the curtain tear tearing from top to bottom is so significant that we don't have to go through a mediator that's why we don't need a priest that's why we're not catholic because we don't need a priest to get to the father we only need jesus he is our high priest now when the centurion oh sorry then jesus calling out with a loud voice said Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Luke is giving us displays of his deity, right? First, the curtain tearing, the earthquake we don't see, but we know it happens. The blackness over the sky, and now Jesus crying out. Listen to me. It was nearly impossible for someone hanging on a cross to speak because all they could do was push themselves up to get oxygen into their lungs. It is scientifically almost impossible to whisper because he's hanging on that cross, right? And he's pushing up so he can fill his lungs with air. And then the pain when he comes down just of the nerve endings and his whole body collapsing on his lungs, you, you drown in your own fluid. Your lungs just fill up. So here at the end of his life, Jesus cries out, what does it say? With a loud voice. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Over life and death, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He commits himself to God. He has the power over life and death to give up his spirit and to take up life. It's a significant mark here. And that's why Luke wants you to see it. He wants you to understand. With a loud voice, he cried out, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he breathed no more. He died when he was ready to die. He has power over life and death. Listen to me. You're only going to live as long as Jesus says you're going to live. Man, you can go to the gym every day, and you can run on the treadmill, and you can work out, but that will not extend your life a moment. It might make you feel better while you're here. I'm just saying, right? Because you'll feel healthier and you won't be as lethargic. But you're only going to live as long as God says you're going to live. You have to know that the life and death are in his hands. He chose when it was time to give up his spirit and he gave it up when he was ready. A display of his deity. Crying out with a loud voice is a miracle. The darkness over the sky is a miracle. The curtain, it's a miracle. Three miracles. Bam, bam, bam. Earthquake, graves, people walking around. That's a miracle. You don't see that every day. I've never seen that. That's right. Verse 47 says, now, when the centurion, who's the centurion? He's the guard over all the people that are, that are being crucified. He's the head guard. He's watching this. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place all these events he praised God saying certainly this man was innocent certainly this man was innocent you know what Mark says Mark says in chapter 15 verse 39 certainly this man was the son of God so he says this man is innocent he must be the son of God wow wow the centurion, who's not even a Jew. He's a pagan. But he saw it for what it was. He knew that this man had committed no sin. 
2 Corinthians 5.21, and God made him sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he took your place. He took my place. So how will you respond? How will you respond knowing that Jesus died for you? Will you live for him? Or are you going to keep living for yourself? The last passage before we get to our memory verses, verses 48 and 49. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle When they saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts, which is a sign of repentance and humility. Oh, God. Oh, God. They knew that they had saw something miraculous, and they couldn't understand it. They couldn't explain it, but they went away beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at the distance watching these things. Listen, we've seen what a mighty God can do in our own lives. The question is, will we trust him? You know that God is real, or you wouldn't be here today. You know that God is real. You look at the sky, you watch the sunrise, you see the moon set, you see the stars. I mean, you know he's real. What's keeping you from just being all in? Is it bitterness? Is it unforgiveness? Are you holding on to things people say or do? Are you looking down at people? Are you judging people? Look, man, you got to get them out of your sight. Your sight needs to be on Jesus, not on people. It doesn't matter what this person does or that person does or what this person says or that person says. It only matters what Jesus said. That's what matters. That's where our hope lies. That's where our strength comes from. It's all in Jesus. So I'm going to give you a memory verse to go along with, I believe, the way we should respond. And hopefully you'll work on this verse this week. It's second, I mean, it's Colossians chapter two, verses six and seven. It says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, notice, it doesn't say a Lord. It says the Lord. As you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, word Lord, right to mean kurios, right? Master, ruler, he's the boss. Is he your boss? As you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, accepting everything that comes at you with thanksgiving. Like God, there is purpose in everything. All these interruptions are divine. When I get sidetracked, God, I know you can use that. Turn me around. Give me the eyes to see and the heart to believe that you are who you say you are. And then walk with him. Let him fill you up. Let him love you. Let him use you. There's no greater joy than to be used by the king of this universe for his glory and for his honor. Will you pray with me? Lord, you are good to us. We don't deserve your love, your kindness, your mercy, or your grace, much less your forgiveness. But you have offered it freely through Jesus Christ. And you pour out your mercy on our lives every day. Your mercy is new every morning. And you give us new opportunities to serve you and love you and to walk with you. God, you fill our hearts with joy and peace when we take our eyes off this world and we keep our eyes on you. So help us, Lord. Help us to look to you as the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to trust you. That all things work together for our own good, even when we can't see it or understand it, knowing that you've got us, that you've always had us, that you saved us, God, and you will keep us for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.